David Waldman. Hey, how you doing, everybody? Uh, this is it. Live. Yeah, that's right. I like we're live. <laughs> it's true. It's not a tape today. August 21st, Monday, August 21st. That way you know, uh, well, it's one of uh, seven in a cycle of years. But at any rate, uh, August 21st, 2023, for those of you keeping score at home, I don't know what kind of score there is to keep. Everything appears to be working just fine today, which is remarkable because a couple of days ago we lost power and now... Uh, California, where, well, justice isn't there. So for one thing, great, that's fine. But, oh, let's see, uh, the place was under scorching heat, and uh, who knows what kind of uh, wildfire smoke might be going on as well out there. California, under siege, having everything possible happen to them all at once. All the things that aren't, so some of which aren't exactly weather, but get covered on the Weather Channel anyway. Like when you have an earthquake, that, well, they cover that everywhere. The, the earth underneath your house and person shakes and sometimes cracks open. It's worth covering somewhere, right? So weather channel, why not? But also uh, hurricanes and tornadoes, I guess, associated with the hurricanes. So hurricanes, tornadoes, I guess it was it a tropical storm when it finally came uh, on land. And an earthquake in the middle of the storm, whatever the status of the storm was. So I think that's a little unusual, and Justice uh, suggests that uh, something, yeah, <laughs> right, something must be screwed up with the Jewish space lasers at this point. They're on the blink. Maybe they were built by Elon Musk and they were, like autopiloted and just crashed into a tree. Sorry about that. We'll calibrate the uh, the the uh, laser focus a little bit later. We'll try and get rid of it, and maybe we'll make up for it a little bit like, oh, I don't know, uh, some sort of free pizza promotion or something like that, if we can work that out. All right. Greg says it's a post-tropical cyclone. I say it's a... Well, people were saying they had a word for it. A hurricane or something like that. And there was a sharknado in the middle of it as well. It's really crazy out there. And what can I tell you? Californians are ready for anything weather-wise, when, once you consider earthquakes weather as well. So... Uh, anything could happen, and uh, and they they kind of dig it, man. It's really awesome and groovy. So you know they're trendsetters in California. Okay, well, there's many other stories happening as it happens and this week for us. Very exciting. It is, of course, everybody's birthday week. That's one of the weird phenomenons we have going on here at KITM. Everybody has their birthday at the same time, um, like Korea. So you know. That's fantastic. We have a strong affinity there. And also, uh, it is, of course, I think for purposes of the show, we probably just should leave it at this. It is Trump Surrender Week. Now, Trump has been indicted three times before, and each time he's had to come in for an arraignment, which is technically the same thing. It's just, you know, you're surrendering to the custody of police, and whether they decide to keep you in custody or not is... Uh, up to the judges and prosecutors and they try and work these things out. You know, like if you steal somebody's wallet, they might want bail for you. If you try to steal the country, but you have a suit and tie on, people fret, you know, the prosecutors wring their hands and say, what about the future of the country if we punish this guy for his crimes? So I don't expect that the Trump surrender is going to be that much different, except they have been saying that for the Georgia prosecution that they plan to treat him as though he were any other uh, suspect or defendant being tried for crimes. And that means fingerprinting and mug shots, which I guess he's negotiated his way out of in other places. And I'm not positive they're going to go through with it. And I'm not positive how valuable it actually is. I was thinking about it. I mean, I don't know if Trump's lawyers are thinking about it this way or are competent to think about anything, or they just want out of it because uh, Trump feels like it'll be an embarrassment, and so therefore he doesn't want to do it, and so therefore he's asking us to get him out of it. But I mean, I guess if you stop and think about, well, what's the purpose of the mugshot, right? The, I guess the purpose is, well, once you're being brought into the criminal justice system, you lose certain rights right away, 
but you don't necessarily lose the big one until there's been a trial here. But I guess it's still public policy to say, all right, well, if this person is suspected of committing a crime, it is, uh, I guess, also suspected they may be involved in other crimes. And now, in the past, in the future, we'll take a picture of them as we book them in. And at some point, it might become necessary uh, to see if you can identify this person again. You'll want to have the photo or if perhaps they don't show up for trial and you need to make a wanted poster or something. But uh, the idea being, you know, you want uh, the random names assigned to these various criminals. What do they look like? If you want to tell the public or ask a witness, did you see this guy? But Donald Trump is probably one of the more recognizable people out there. And you probably don't need a record of what he looks like, per se. So unless there's some other public policy interest in getting the mug shot, besides just embarrassing somebody who's not you know, who's innocent until proven guilty, except he's actually guilty of a lot of other things, even if not yet this thing, but he's also guilty of that thing. Never mind. Anyway, Greg is here to help straighten this out, clearly. Uh, but anyway, I thought that they might make some legal argument about that. And of course, the fact that he has almost no fingers should mean that there's no fingerprints to take either. So I don't know whether they're going to go ahead with that one. Although I was thinking somebody should mock up something, maybe for a T-shirt of, uh, you know, the fingerprint cards that they have. They got the little boxes where they they put the individual prints in some of the places, the old fashioned way. I think they used to do a box at a time and roll. Now they just have a giant box and you just get your whole hands <laughs> inky and stick the the hands down once. And it's a lot faster, but I thought it would be fun to get one of those cards and mock it up so that the fingerprints just barely reached into the box. You know, maybe even the prints themselves are really tiny. I'm sure it's something Darth could do. Um, but anyway, it will be fun. We'll all have fun with the fact that Trump has to surrender to the police one more time. It is also debate week, so we'll be talking about that. Greg's already here to do that, or among other things, so let's just roll with it. Good morning, Greg. How you doing? Good morning. So, you know, the thing that I really want to come out of this uh, Fulton Jail thing, first of all, uh, Trump's a, a germaphobe. Oh, yeah, so, right. So I want him to walk into the not-so-clean Fulton County Jail Hmm. and experience the feel for it so he gets an idea what it's like going to prison. Sure. Of course, he'd be in the Georgia State Penitentiary, not the Fulton County Jail, if he actually serves time, but that's another story for another day. Uh, the most important thing I want to come out of the mugshot and fingerprint thing is I want them to publish his height and weight, and then I want <laughs> Barney Jackson to comment on it. Yes, I've been waiting for that for a long time. That, too, would make a great T-shirt of him standing up against the six-foot-zero line or whatever it is and uh you know it, it seems petty but so does pretending you're six it, it'd be great to have him there with a lineup of like trump and elvis impersonators <laughs> right and can you uh, pick out trump from the real you know and uh, by the way you know he's uh 330 pounds and already asking for a hamburger yeah it's it could be could be the end of that myth but uh, of course he'll probably say well liberal prosecutors lied about my height they photoshopped it uh, whatever i don't know but it'll be exciting he'll be doing that i guess by friday i don't know whether he'll hold out for and it friday wanted, uh, televised That's yeah fine. well that will be fun i don't know whether we're going to get televised but certainly I, I don't know some pictures on the way in if there's a mug shot we'll get it that's nice and uh the debate is what Wednesday night. Uh, I still love your idea yeah, the of not going Wednesday because night. of the, you know not going to the debate because you're surrendering. I think that's that somehow that works. For it Trump. makes the most sense. I'm not sure what he's going to do. He's already declared he's not going to go to the first two debates, which is two. the uh, Fox debates. I don't even know about the second one. But when is that? Is that soon? I don't know. Nobody no. cares. Right. Okay. Fine. No, the kitty table debate. There's a guy. I mean, the from more the people Dakotas they let it. in, the less important it is. And, mm. uh, you know, we'll we'll see. Uh, of course, there's always these people in the press who are dying for a horse race and want to make Ron DeSantis yeah. happen. I want to make but, Will uh, Hurd. You can't happen. make Fetch happen. It doesn't work that way. Huh. All right. Well, he's making himself happen, in the, but into a loser. But it's interesting to watch. Right. And we got some really it's interesting polling from the weekend that we're going to spend a lot of time talking about because I think it tells us a lot of things. All right. But we'll start with this piece just to set the mood. Uh, what kind of what mood? the polls may be getting wrong about Trump by Russell Berman in The Atlantic. New research suggests the criminal hmm. charges against Trump aren't actually helping him in the GOP primary race. What? Now, there's some data to suggest otherwise, but we'll, we'll get to that. Hmm. Most traditional polls have asked respondents directly whether the indictments have changed their attitude about Trump or their likelihood to vote for him. 
All right. I mean, it's a good question. According to Matt Graham, one of the authors of a new survey and an assistant professor at Temple University, this type of query leads to biased answers and it devolves into a proxy question for whether oh. voters and Republicans in particular like the former president in the first place. Respondents don't always answer questions the way we want them to, Graham told me. In other words, uh, people lie to pollsters. Yes. Republicans want to say, I still support him regardless of the indictment. And if you don't give him a chance to say that, they're going to use the question to say that. Hmm. Okay. So they figure that's a, a flaw. And they think if they elicit more accurate answers about Trump by asking respondents to assess their view of him as if they didn't know he had been indicted. Suppose you didn't know about the indictment. How would you have answered the following question? How likely are you to vote for Donald Trump? And then the other half. Hmm. They ask questions that pollsters more commonly use. Given this indictment, <laughs> how likely a are real you to for Donald Trump? The experiment produced significantly different results. Like other surveys, the poll based on the traditional format found the indictments increased Trump's support, but the poll based on the counterfactual found that the indictments slightly hurt his standing, reducing wow. by 1.6% the likelihood Republicans would vote for him. Now, hmm. that's not... Uh, even in in these authors' minds, enough to change who wins. Trump wins, right? The, the Republican I mean, primary, and he's not arguing his team's finding should fundamentally alter perceptions about his chances of becoming the nominee. But the emerging and false narrative that charging a political candidate is good. Okay, I well, I've never heard that as a narrative before, except for this one guy. This is not. Something that they, I don't think they're going to write down in the books. Like, you know what you should do is get get indicted. It works. Right. So uh, a couple of things about that. Firstly, okay. the Iowa poll comes out, and that comes out this morning. Uh, NBC is co-sponsoring it with the Des Moines Register, DMR. So this is the Ann Seltzer poll of Iowa, hmm. the gold standard. Ah. Okay. And first of all. Gold. I love gold. Yeah. Yeah, gold. Gold is good. Guilt. <laughs> I like guilt. I don't, I don't, I don't feel <laughs> guilt. I just do right. guilt. <laughs> That's right. Like James Bond guilt, you know. Yeah. Goldfinger guilt. Uh, so I'd like to see if he could actually get sucked out of a window. I don't think he could fit. <laughs> he would plug it. Unlike Goldfinger, he would not be sucked out of a plane window. <laughs> He'd fix it. He'd fix it. <laughs> He'd help everybody. I have repaired this uh, plane. I'm here because I'm helping people. <laughs> I, anyway. All right. Yes. So here's the Iowa poll. It comes out and it says, survey says, Ding. Trump 42, DeSantis 19, big lead, but not overwhelming the way that uh, national polls are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Scott 9, Haley 6, Pence 6, Christy 5, Ramaswamy 4. He's not doing well in Iowa. Okay. Uh, Burgum 2, Heard cool. 1. Ah. Elder Hutchinson Johnson and Suarez, Perry Johnson Ooh. and Mayor Suarez from Florida. Huh. Larry Elder, who always runs, Asa Hutchinson, who shouldn't be running but is, uh, all at uh, about 1%. This is Welcome a margin of error of 4.9. And Ann Seltzer says the race could be closer than it may first seem. 63% say they support Trump as their first or second choice, but the same for DeSantis. He gets 61. Okay. And interestingly... They were in the field for the poll when the Georgia indictment came. So half of the sample is before, half of the sample is after. He got a small bump. This is the right. strongest evidence I've seen to date that these indictments, or at least the Georgia indictment, helped him. Mm -hmm. Okay. However, yes. this is a really interesting observation that the New York Times made. How GOP views of Biden are helping Trump in the Republican primary. All right, why not? In interviews and polling, many Republican voters believe Biden is so weak that picking the most electable candidate to beat him no hmm. longer matters. <laughs> and that's in it's fact what we around. see in the Iowa poll. Okay. All right. So what we see is that two-thirds of the voters in Iowa, uh, potential caucus goers, say they want somebody who agrees with them on the issues. And only one third say they want somebody who's the most likely to beat Biden. Okay, because they don't think it's hard. Yes. In the Interesting. Democratic primary in 2020, it was the exact opposite. 
Two thirds said, I don't really care whether he agrees with me or not. I just want somebody who's going to win. Yeah. And one third said, no, I need somebody to agree with me. The exact opposite for Republicans. And what appears to have happened is the combination of DeSantis being so weak Mm -hmm. and Fox News force feeding Republican voters with the idea that Biden is so old and doddering, he's not even going to make it out on the debate stage, let alone win the election. So anybody could run. So why not Trump? It's sure, not like you have right, to worry right, about fine. whether he's going to lose. He can't lose. He's running against Biden. Hmm. And this is the Republican electorate. It's idiotic. It's not what the Republican all electorate? Republicans think. It's not what Republican analysts think. It's what the voters think, wow. which is only going to help Biden, of course. But- it colors and flavors how they vote in the primary because they're just thinking about it differently. I don't okay. have to worry about whether or not he's competitive. Of course he's competitive. My grandmother could beat Biden. I, I guess they might think that. I don't know who their grandmother is. You know, right. Unless it's Margaret Thatcher or something like that. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, clearly that's what's going on. And there's another twist to it. The CBS poll came out over the week. <laughs> Excuse me. Ooh, also, sure. with fas- fascinating <clears throat> information. Uh, yes. They asked, uh, why haven't the indictments hurt? In part, it's because Trump voters generally believe it's Trump who tells them the truth. Sure. More than conservative media, more than their own friends and family, more than religious leaders. More than the police. Feel Apparently. what they tell you is true. Top answers among Trump voters. 71% mm. say Trump. 63% say friends and family. 56% say conservative media. And 42% say religious leaders. Mm. So you can't have a Russell Moore from the Southern Baptist group or Beth Moore or, or a religious leader saying he's not following Jesus. Because what happens is the evangelicals in Iowa and other places say, why should he? Jesus is no. too woke. Uh, yeah. Did you ever hear the Servant on the Mount? Come on. Oh my it's God. ridiculous. That's you don't right. have to do that. Now, that's going to have long-term that's implications new. for evangelical uh, voters. Yes. As they and their church split on, like, who's more important, Jesus or that other guy. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, does it remind you of a cult? It should. Is oh, it uh, technically Jesus the definition of a cult? I'll leave that for experts. But uh. it's pretty freaking weird yeah i would say so well the best measure i think of whether or not it really is true that an indictment will help a candidate is how many of the republican candidates besides trump are out committing crimes trying to get indicted and if the answer is zero then you know what really happens in the main when you're indicted right and i have a working theory about all of this which isn't written up anywhere But uh, my working theory uh, isn't simply that uh, the dinosaurs were larger in the middle and shorter at both ends. It's it's that what these polls are picking up, like the academic poll, it suggests that the indictments may not be helping him or the one that says that uh, they believe Trump tells the truth and nobody else is that Republicans in their heart of hearts know He's what we in New York finally called as I was growing up. He is a scumbag. (laughs) Yes. They know it. Yeah. But they don't want to tell pollsters. They They don't want to tell friends and family. And they don't want to tell themselves they made a big mistake. They can't. So they know it. And so if you sort of, you know, get at the question in an indirect way, you pick up a little bit, you know, weaker Trump support than you would otherwise think from his large numbers. That doesn't change whether or not he wins, but they feel guilty about it. Okay, well, they should. They're and so bad. that's why you see some seeming weakness. And yet when you look at the numbers, he's ahead. And that's why you say, well, you know, of course, I'm only going to believe Trump. I don't believe anybody else who says anything else. They are. uh crazy they are Mm -hmm. cult like truthy you know culty uh but they are not by any means the majority in the country it's not clear they're the majority in the republican party but there's certainly uh a majority of uh primary caucus voters oh yeah uh well i guess so primary and uh caucus voters are not all of Republicans. 
And so what winds up happening is that Trump is headed toward being the nominee regardless. And the uh, indictments and what happens out of them and even conviction Party aren't crime. Make much of a difference at the same time doesn't help him in the general, which people have pointed out. This is Andy McCarthy, National Review, uh, NRO uh, contributing editor, uh, tweeting, this is a very simple proposition. Trump can't win. 65% are already against them. We talked about those poll numbers last week. Mm-hmm. And that's before Democrats launch barrage after getting him nominated. If we finally grasp that, his support will collapse. If not, we're going to lose everything. And okay. Democrats will use a majority to remake the Supreme Court. Nominate awesome. him if you want, but that's the reality. All right. And uh, so somebody asked Daniel McCarthy, oh, well, if Trump could win, would that change your view? Because after all, do you want somebody who's going to win or do you want somebody right. you know, who believes in your views? And McCarthy said, no, I thought he should have been convicted at impeachment, ah. impeachment trial. Yes. I mean, that doesn't. That means he should have been disqualified. That's what we'll talk about after the record. <laughs> First, yes. I couldn't vote for him, but that's irrelevant because he can't win. His candidacy would mean Democrats crush us at least two catastrophic years after that, too. He's ignoring the premise of the question. But all right. Well, I mean. Uh, it is an interesting one. Like if you said to somebody who said, well, I, I thought he should have been convicted when he was impeached or various other things, etc. Uh, yeah, but the the premise of the question is, well, if he could win, like, would it be OK with you if he were, a, you know, a violent criminal, but got another four years in office? And he, he said no, right that? because basically he's a scumbag. Yeah, he did say no. But then he went on to say, but it doesn't matter because, but like, I, it, it is an interesting question. Like, if you were going to get your way on most social policy issues and all the culture war issues from a criminal, would you take it? I don't know that. I mean, he says, he says that he'll continue to say no, but uh, I don't know. Maybe we can design a clever but, but pollster that's, you know, approach. But that's to an honest answer. Out. If Trump could win yeah. the presidency, if he yeah. could win against Biden, would that change your view? Yeah, and it's a good McCarthy question. McCarthy says no. Yeah, but the, I thought the he reasoning was. Yeah. I think he's terrible. I think he's awful. I think he's a scumbag. And besides, he can't win. So it's See, an irrelevant question. But no, I don't think yeah, that right. he should, you know, be somebody you vote for, even if he could win. I guess. I guess maybe then they have to say, well, all right, if you're going to keep changing the premise, I'll change one too. Uh, let's say Trump does win. Will you leave the country? Is it that bad? Uh, well, that's a completely different question. It is. We, we lived here under Nixon. One. It was awful. Yes. And uh, everybody talks about how Bill Barr was the worst attorney general ever. Yeah. It's possible. But then again, John Mitchell. So, you know, he's in tough competition there. Why is everybody leaving Alberto Gonzalez out of this? Well, you know, Mitchell wound up in jail. Gonzalez didn't. Right. But he was bad. Gonzalez was just know. incompetent. Mitchell was evil. Uh, yeah, and I Barr guess that is, way is competent to to and evil. Bill Barr. Yeah, and a lot slicker than Mitchell or Gonzalez. That's true. Well, all right. I mean, and uh, says you're all not the right things. When he was in office, he did nothing, guy. and that tells you everything you need to know about Bill Barr. All right. Because well, how about this? if you ask Bill Barr the, the question that Andy McCarthy was asked, if Trump could win, would you change your view? Barr is absolutely. Oh yeah. I sure. mean, that's not even a question. No, I, I, it's not. Uh, and that's something. That's a, that's a difference between him and McCarthy. I, I, I'll say this: I don't believe McCarthy. Okay, how's that? I don't. You ask me. Well, a pollster has asked me: Do I believe uh, his answer? No, I don't. Okay. okay. I mean, he does. He believes his answer. So well, it's look, 50/50. there's a lot of never Trumpers who are, in fact, still never Trumpers. Yes. But how you know, which is another thing. Maybe we'll just talk about this a little bit between now and the two minutes that we have for the two minute break. Yeah, because you can't get Um, anything else in there. But, you know, there's there's this thing that uh, so-called sober uh, uh, conservatives, you know, Mm -hmm. maybe Hugh Hewitt, uh, a lot of the people at National Review, not necessarily McCarthy, but others. Um, you know, uh, we'll say things like, look, I know Trump did a lot of bad things. But yeah. my God, look at all these people who hate him. I oh. hate them. Yeah, you made me a Nazi. You, you Exactly. So they are what are these days called Nazis, anti uh, oh. anti Trumpers. Yes, right. 
right? Sure, and I and so the this. term gets to mean, look, uh, I know Trump is bad, but look at these people who are lining up to disrespect mm-hmm. Donald Trump. And let me tell you about why they're all wrong. These are the people that will write articles that say whatever Trump did, whatever it was, each and every single person trying to indict and prosecute him for it mm-hmm. are overreaching. Yes, no matter what. Well, no you matter know, what. Well, why do you right. say that? Because – if they weren't overreaching, he'd be out and Democrats would be in. And we can't have that. So yeah. I understand that he did a whole lot of bad things. All right. But obviously it has to be immoral but not illegal because if it were illegal, I would be saying they're right. I can't do that. That would help Democrats. And therefore, mm-hmm. I am anti-anti-Trump. And, um, you know, anti, there's a anti, whole anti-Trump. bunch of people who are on that bag wagon. Yeah. That wagon. Uh, there's an anti to that. And if you want to get on that wagon... There's a lot of antis, anti, anti, anti Trump. Yeah, well, I'm driving. I, I see you looking at me, looking at you, looking at me, looking at you. But yeah. you know that <laughs> it, it's a thing, and so this is a, the same sort of thing that allows Iowa uh, caucus goers on the Republican side. There may not be a Democratic caucus, so it has to be Republican caucus goers. Uh, right. who uh, say, look, I know in my heart of hearts he's a crook and a scumbag, but of course I'm going to vote for him because the alternative would be to have a Democrat, and we simply can't have that. Uh, I guess, although, yeah, it might not, it might Actually, not be your heart of hearts. is better, and some people come around to it. That's why people, you know, like Tom Nichols say, just suck it up and vote for Biden. You know, yeah. I did in 2020, I'll do it again. Good, all right, those are the people to talk to. Uh, and it may not be your heart of hearts that is saying that. You think it is, because you don't know what else might be talking to you, but... Uh, there are lots of uh, other parts that are far more disgusting than your heart that might be doing the talking. Hi, everybody. It's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time, just to tell you again, another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad. Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction. And whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure, recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGrowX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options, too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't, or at least shouldn't, do it without you. Hope you'll be on board soon, too. Thanks for all your support. This isn't going to change my mind about who to vote for, even though. Why would it? Let's talk right through it, but I, we're having such a good time having our conversation during the break. Good morning, everybody. We're back. You know that, and uh, you know... We're alive during the breaks. I don't know why we have to. Hide. It's alive. <laughs> so okay, it becomes a bit of an editing mess. Every but once in a while, what you gonna do? All right. Uh, oh, you had something it's you, alive want, you had on Roots Radio. Yeah, we could put that in the beginning. You had something on tap that you wanted to go to. I, I forget what we were gonna move to after the break. Dang it! Uh, we're gonna talk remembered. a little bit about. Um, oh yeah. Okay. You know, uh, disqualifying Trump and, right. and the legal theories behind that, because there's been a lot written about it over the weekend. There have. But I wanted to start uh, with something else. Uh, there's this story that I saw, oh. which really got me annoyed, uh, from hmm. the Washington Post. Girl. Uh, not about the California stuff, because that's like too new. I don't think you could. Blame but about them for the disaster that. in Maui. Oh. All right. Okay. Uh, which is a disaster, and Biden's sure, going there. Of course. And the federal oh, government right. has actually organized quite a bit of aid, given that Hawaii is an island, yes. and it's not easy to get support there. Uh, and uh, 
The um, topic in the Washington Post is, and listen to the framing, ahead of Maui visit, Biden's governmental and personal response scrutinized. White House officials countered that even as he was publicly silent, the president was actively engaged behind the scenes throughout the tragedy. Well, sure. And then the first 12 paragraphs, uh -oh. more than 120 hours passed between when Biden spoke about the devastating Maui fires and his next substantive remark about the tragedy the following week. And during that five day stretch, the full scope of the crisis came into clearer view. Behind the scenes, aides say, Biden was leading a robust by the book federal response, speaking daily with state officials in Hawaii, ordering federal responders to provide all assistance necessary. But as the death toll was escalating, his muted public approach stood in sharp contrast. All now, right. they're upset about this. Yes, I have seen that. Why are they upset about this? They talk uh, about what Biden is actually doing, and they're upset about what Biden is saying. And yes. I had a reporter friend that said, you know, it's really simple. Mm -hmm. The Beltway people are really upset because Biden is not giving public comments. And because Biden is not giving public comments, they can't ask him about Hunter Biden. Because <laughs> they always do that no matter what. They don't give a crap about Maui. That's they just true. want the opportunity to be on TV saying, but what about Hunter Biden? Yeah, maybe. And he's denying that to them. And so they're really pissed off. And so they write articles that say, what he says is different than what he does. What he does may be picture perfect, but what he says is different uh, and terrible. And, you know, how many days has it been since he's had a press conference? And why doesn't he let us ask him about Hunter Biden? You know, mm -hmm. and so that that was the take. And I, the framing of this is exactly that. If Biden is doing exactly the right things and the people in Hawaii, like the governor, are very happy with what he's doing, What's this stupid article about? Yeah, I don't know. I mean... Why do you even write it? I don't know. I guess the only thing I saw or really paid any attention to was that... Uh, it, I guess when people uh, showed him saying no comment, they were like, well, he smiled. But it's oh, not even clear yeah. that's what he said. I, I, okay. A Fox News reporter reported that that's ah, what he said. Okay. I mean, I didn't even look at it that far. I was sort of like, well, okay, that seems odd. But, you know, I'm because I am... Who I am, I'm able to say. Well, I'm positive. I, you know, I'd be willing to swear that uh, that uh, Joe Biden is not happy that uh, Maui's on fire. So I'm but, fine. You know, listen to the next two paragraphs. Yeah. And this is from an aide to Biden. If President Biden could just teleport himself over, he would have come here in five seconds. I've never seen such dedication in president, who within six hours dedicated his time to determine this was an emergency and to commit full repair, full reconstruction for our people here. In Hawaii. In fact, that's the yeah. governor saying that All right. in Hawaii. Well, but the next paragraph is the key yeah. one for the whole article from my point of view uh -huh. and, and the framing and why I'm bringing it up. Listen to this. But as criticism, comma, largely from Republicans, comma, well, what do you know? has intensified over the past week, White House officials have mounted a sweeping effort to showcase the president's personal involvement in handling this crisis. In other words, the people criticizing it are Benghazi Republicans paper towel throwing Who gives an effing crap what they think yeah why is that driving this story because somebody has to there has to be an excuse for me writing this negative story it can't be my idea because it's stupid so, uh I so know. i just Maybe thought i would it. point that out it really got me annoyed because yeah, the whole I can premise of the article that. is wrong they point out in the article biden's doing all the right things and when you dig down in the article you find out the only reason they wrote it is because Marjorie Taylor Greene doesn't like what Biden is doing. He's Who doing gives the right thing, so we have to be upset. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Republicans are extremely weird about everything, of course, and this is no exception. This is, is, in fact, a great example. I think one of the more popular Republican memes I saw circulating was uh, of a picture of a, a smiling Barack Obama, I guess, sitting on the beach somewhere with one of his daughters. I didn't look closely to see which one it was. Both smiling, and but they're smiling. I guess they must feel that they're smiling smugly because the meme uh, headline there was, I can't even remember how they put it, but basically they were expressing, you know, this suspicion. Can you believe it? I mean, of course this was a conspiracy because then not even a single blade of grass of the Obama estate burned down. 
And as others were pointing out to them, well, that's because the Obama estate they, is on Oahu. They're not on Maui. Not, it's a different island. Not Maui. But, you know, that's how islands work. And sometimes if, they're, but if it's the, the whole thing, thing is on fire, when, uh, it doesn't go through the it ocean. It out that, that uh, Trump was indicted. Yeah. The announcement yeah. came late at night because the grand jury in uh, Georgia had to take all day to vote on right. it. Right. And it happened that Hillary Clinton had previously oh, yes, been right. booked by some genius booker who should have gotten a raise on <laughs> Rachel Maddow so that she was live on the air when the indictment came out. Yes. That was good. Yeah, but uh, that too was It was obviously great. And Hillary Clinton, you know, was asked about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, she chuckled about something or other and then went on to say, this is terrible for the country. I feel awful. This is not good. Mm -hmm. No president should ever be in this situation. And the memes uh, from the right were, oh, Hillary is chuckling over uh, yeah. uh, Trump's indictment. She's Which terrible. That woman is she awful. She can't, you know, uh, yada, yada. And, and that's exactly the opposite of what she said. And their complaints about Biden is the exact These opposite of what he's doing. And that's how you get those stories in the New York Times saying, well, Biden is so awful and he can't do anything right. Yeah. Uh, you know, right after this incredible summit where he gets Korea uh, South Korea and uh, Japan at the same table to agree on stuff in a trilateral arrangement with the U.S., which is unheard of because South Korea has such deep resentments about, uh, you know, the treatment by Japan in World War II and beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, to get that to happen is just, out, you know, incredible. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so, but, but he can't that. do anything. He Well, you know, he just had this uh, tour de force uh uh, master yes. a, a diplomat thing that he's nobody else could, literally nobody else could pull off and so you convince yourself that he's terrible and he's awful and doddering and can't do anything and that's how you get those stories in the New York Times that Republicans don't really care about who can mm. win because they think anybody can and just they're they're wrong about everything that's okay that one I think keep it up I say go ahead Keep making that assumption and nominate the worst possible person, and then we'll destroy you. That way, we well, I'll show you. That's exactly what we're going to do. Well, all right. You show me. Mm. Okay. Well, uh, they're very weird and stupid people, and I, I can see how this would be very annoying, and it m must be annoying at some level, although maybe Joe Biden is just the kind of person who by now is like, eh, this is going to happen. You, The better you do at uh, disaster response – the worst they're going to accuse you of having been. Because well, the other side of, the point, of course, is everything is uh, projection with Republicans. Yes. They were so burned by Katrina that yes. everything has to be the Democrats' Katrina. I don't know how often. <laughs> they're really I trying can't to even remember Obama's Katrina was like about something that you don't even remember now because it was so stupid. Yeah. And they desperately wanted Cindy? this to be Biden's Katrina. It isn't. Yeah. It'll never be. Okay. Because Democrats actually care about the people who are in these disasters. You know, not yeah. not just, oh, it doesn't matter because it wasn't evangelical, so we are not going to do anything about it. Even uh, even Trump wanted everything to be somebody's Katrina, too. Even when he was dealing with the hurricane in, uh, what was the name of the hurricane in in, in Puerto Rico? There were like 15 Maria. of them, of course. Maria. Uh, how could I forget? And, uh, uh, you know. <laughs> The West Side Story fans are aghast. But, um, yeah, I, he, in the middle of uh, recover, recovery, such as it was from Maria, uh, even Trump then was saying, yeah, well, at least it's not Katrina. Like, that was bad. He's, uh, he's actually visiting people who have just lived through this thing and throwing paper towels at them and saying, yeah, it's not so bad. Katrina, now that was a mess. Yeah, I know. You did that, too. So let's go back to Your that partner. New York Times article about how Republicans have this bizarre view of Biden. The focus on electability, mm. the basic notion of which candidates has the best shot of uh, winning a general election, was most intense in the aftermath of the disappointing 2022 midterms. Every once in a while, like a bucket of cold water, they get uh, hit with reality. Republicans were stung by losses of Trump-backed candidates in key swing states like Arizona, Michigan, and Pennsylvania – and Carrie Lake is back and, you know, we'll see mm -hmm. who's going to run in uh, Montana. And the issue offered a way to persuade a Republican electorate still very much in the thrall of Trump to consider throwing its lot in with a fresh face. It was a permission slip to move on, which they didn't take. Right. 
said the narrator. But nine months later, interviews with pollster strategists, elected officials and Republican voters in early voting states show that the dim Republican opinion of Biden's mental facilities, Mm -hmm. faculties and uh, political skills has complicated that case in deep and unexpected ways. I mean, I would hope anybody could beat Biden, said Heather Hora, 52, as she waited in line for a photo with Mr. Trump at the Iowa Republican dinner. Uh Echoing a sentiment expressed in more than 30 interviews with Iowa Republicans in recent weeks. There's the rivals, like DeSantis, are still pushing an electability case, but even their advisors and other strategists acknowledge the diminished views of Biden have sapped the pressure voters once felt about the need to nominate somebody new. When Republican primary voters in a recent New York Times Siena poll, which is a very good poll, were asked which it's their poll, but it happens to be a very good poll, were asked which candidate were better able to beat Biden. Fifty eight percent picked Trump. Twenty eight percent selected DeSantis. The perception that Biden is the weakest possible candidate has lowered the electability question in the calculus of primary voters, said Josh Holmes, a Republican strategist and a longtime advisor to Senator Mitch McConnell. Uh, So you can assume Holmes doesn't love Trump. Though the urgency of electability has plainly waned, it remains one of the most powerful tools Trump's rivals have. And so you have to keep the story alive. Keep hope alive, as Jesse Jackson said, that maybe somehow or other people like DeSantis can come through at the end and uh, swoop up and win Iowa. Now, there's a reason for that. Retail politics. Bob Dole had a bigger lead than this and only wound up winning by three. Hmm. Okay. George Bush uh, had a lead this big and won easily. So it doesn't always happen that your lead collapses, mm-hmm. but sometimes it does. Okay. And so, you know, uh, everybody's sort of hoping somebody else will take him out. Chris Christie is the most disliked person in the Republican Party. And on Wednesday at the kitty table debate, you know, he'll certainly make his case that Trump is terrible. But uh, more likely than not, everybody's going to gang up on DeSantis uh, mm-hmm. While DeSantis gangs up uh, as a gang of one on Ramaswamy. <laughs> yeah, I'm not certain I understand that that theory, but apparently that's part of the like the leaked uh, strategy book for him is somehow. Yeah, and by the way, it's stupid. He doesn't have to. Ramaswamy's doing terrible in Iowa. I, 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 he's I, only I, doing well in New Hampshire. Does this mean is he? Are they saying, oh, he's the one that's going to emerge from the pack and dislodge yeah. you from number two, Ramaswamy? Yeah. In fact, it'll be Tim Scott who dislodges him in the end, is my guess. <laughs> like this strategy book. Did Tim Scott write this strategy book? Yeah. By any chance? I mean, the first thought is his wife, who we've heard a couple times is supposedly running things. And, and I mean, maybe it's true if you think that she doesn't know anything about politics and you think she's writing the books, uh, writing the strategy, and the strategy ends up being look out for Ramaswamy. Maybe that is true, but... Right. Or as, as they say in Florida, poor way? Casey DeSantis, that's uh, Ron DeSantis' wife. She's going to have to get used to flying commercial again. <laughs> maybe that's – or maybe she wants to get back to it. I don't really know. I, I don't know what her background is enough to know whether it's fair to say, well, just some political wife. She doesn't know anything. She might be more savvy than her husband is for all I know. She's but, a media figure, I think. Okay. I, I mean, think like Carrie something. Lake, I think she came out of oh, like well, uh, then, broadcast media. I guess never mind. That doesn't really help – at all, actually. Then, but so the Times goes on to say conservative hmm. media led by Fox News has played a role in shaping GOP views. Fox has often elevated DeSantis as the future of the Republican Party coverage. Sure. It's frustrated the former president. And that's why he's skipping the Fox debates. Oh. But the network's persistent harping on Biden's frailties may have inadvertently undercut any effort to build up DeSantis and his campaign. More than two thirds of Republicans who describe Fox News or another conservative outlet as the single source they most often turn to for news thought Trump was better able to beat Biden in the Times-Siena poll, a 40-point advantage over Mr. DeSantis. Those who cited mainstream news outlets said Trump was a stronger candidate, but by less than half the margin. Hmm. All right. Right. So then they go on to say, well, there's no question Biden's old, but... uh, Interviews with Republican voters in Iowa in recent weeks have revealed a consistent impression of Mr. Biden is weak and deteriorating. I see. One gaffe after another. What strength is a candidate, said another. He's a train wreck, said a third. I see. Uh, Karen Munoz, a campaign spokesman for Biden, said uh, Republican, Kevin Munoz said, Republican depictions of Biden as old were recycled attacks that had repeatedly failed. It's a losing strategy. They know it. 
Electability is more than just beating Biden, said Dave Winston, a Republican pollster. Republicans need to choose a candidate who can build a majority coalition, especially with independents, to win the House and Senate. And there was always structural challenges in running a primary campaign centered on electability and then hurdles specific to Trump. It all goes down to the fact that just about no matter how you pick it apart and which angle you pick, every aspect of Ron DeSantis's campaign is flawed. Yes. You cannot win on tactics when your strategy is flawed. All right. I uh, urge him to keep trying anyway. Yes. Well, you know, he will. And In that's great way. and uh, good for him. Yes, and his shiny, shiny boots. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, great. It's a weird <laughs> world. Right. Uh, and it is, it is funny how they, yeah, so many Republicans are so sure that uh, – I like that. It's an interesting phenomenon. So they put aside the electability question because he Biden, in their mind, is so eminently beatable. And it's weird because there's – I mean, I guess there's sort of a mirror image on on the Democratic side from a different – slightly different angle the idea of like well uh, for instance some people suggesting well maybe biden is, is too old or isn't the strongest candidate or fresh blood or something and no 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 but others say uh you know that but the republicans are about to nominate the worst possible candidate the guy who absolutely has no chance of winning and then the answer to that is oh yeah you said that in 2016 and then everybody wrings their hands again because oh my gosh we did say that in 2016 and I don't know. I mean, it doesn't seem to be having an effect just because, at least on this side, you know, there's, it's still a realistic calculus that we're making. No, Biden, you know, he's not everybody's dream candidate, but can he win? Well, yeah. you, you do <laughs> you read, bet. you know, you did. bizarre stuff, right? Like yeah. all of the reporting uh, a couple of days ago that said, oh, the candidate that Biden really fears is Nikki Haley. <laughs> I always love that. All right. Sure. Really? I mean. Yes, people have told me off the record mm-hmm. that that's what they really. Come on. Yeah. Haley's polling in like the 5% range. I love when they try to pull that. Yeah. And so what are you saying and why are you saying it? Uh, You know, well, we just have to make the point that uh, other people besides Trump or who they fear. So Republicans should hear us and nominate somebody else. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, Tim Scott, Tim Scott's the one to what? No, it's Ron DeSantis. He's the one that always has a way of being the comeback. You know, yeah. Come on. Trump well, is going to be the nominee on the Republican side. The Republican yes, voters have already uh, decided. It doesn't really matter what the uh, talking heads decide and Republican strategists decide. Trump is going to be the nominee. He is eminently beatable. He's really weak in the general election. That doesn't guarantee anything, see 2016. But he's a terribly weak candidate. Mm-hmm. And he lost in 2020. And he's weaker now than he was in 2020. And you know what? Normal people, not Republican voters in Iowa, but normal people yeah. don't like their presidents being uh, indicted and convicted. Uh, or they won't choose uh, indicted and convicted people as their presidents. That they don't particularly care for it. They think okay. it says something well, about that's it. That's all right. Uh, not Ramaswamy, though. He likes it. That's why he's uh, Well, so he's dangerous. not a normie by any uh, yeah. stretch of the imagination. He's an incredible lightweight who has no conception whatsoever of either how the government works. Yes. Or, oh, well, uh, you know, he? how uh, That's a plus. Think. That's a positive. That makes me smart. You could borrow from Trump on that one. Do you think there's any chance that uh, Casey DeSantis actually has someone else in mind and was like, what the problem is, if I write it down in the strategy book, it's going to leak. So I'll fake them out and I'll put them one that everyone will know I'm kidding if I say yeah you got to look out for and you got to hit Ramaswamy or they say hammer Ramaswamy which is hilarious to try, try to say that 10 times hammer Ramaswamy but uh, can be done like it might be you know a, a joke or like they'll never print that when the they leak it with fake yeah I don't know I just I, I can't believe that anybody would actually think you know who's really super dangerous in all this yeah, like, no, that's not going to – it can't uh, possibly Kevin be Cruz's true. Here's summing up Ramaswamy. Yeah. Ramaswamy's at uh, The Gathering, which is uh, oh, Eric yeah. Erickson's uh, big, except for Trump, uh, 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 large conservative gathering in Georgia over the weekend, which Georgia folks are really trying to make happen. I don't know that anybody really cares, but, you know, Ramaswamy's there. And he okay. says, and I quote, I've fired underperformers in the private sector. I'm going to do it for probably 75% of the people who work as federal bureaucrats in the government. 
Sure. Mass layoffs are absolutely what I'm bringing to the D.C. bureaucracy. You got it. That's after sucking up the uh, Putin and saying, mm-hmm. of course, you know, he'd give Ukraine to Putin and that would be the end of it. You oh. said that, too. Oh, well, that's a new. Kevin Cruz says, look, if your first ever engagement with politics is a presidential run, maybe it's a good idea to read up just a little on the rules so you don't sound as clueless as a toddler. Yes. When I'm president, I'm going to ban all voters under the age of 25, which is also what he said. When I'm president, I'm going to fire 75 percent of the federal workforce. Sure, you are a scamp. <laughs> Let's yeah. get you to soccer practice. Right. I guess. Although, yeah, I mean, in a way, that was sort of a Trumpy approach to things. Just sort of think the president can do anything they want and I'll just promise that. And I don't know whether that's what I, I don't think that's in Ramaswamy's head. Like, well, I'll just emulate Trump in that way. I think he really believes you know, you can do whatever you want. You're the CEO of the country and what you say right, goes. Exactly. And- so Kevin Cruz says, imagine having the self-confidence of one of those businessmen who gets vaguely interested mm-hmm. in politics as some sort of midlife crisis and decides that their starting point should be a run for the presidency. And even then you're sort of spitballing your way through it. Like even it Mike Bloomberg knew he had to run and be mayor first. Yeah. Oh. It, it, that occurs to me all the time. I mean, the, what it must be like to live in that world where, you know. I guess it just happens if you make it to a certain level and there's a, a whole core of people whose existence, their job is making it, making you think you're awesome and implementing everything that falls out of your brain, I guess you begin to believe it. Well, you know, Chris says, post-Trump, the floodgates That's are not- open. Uh, Vivek, Kane, Schultz, Steyer, Yang, they just jump in because <laughs> yeah. if a con man could do it, who can't? Right. Exactly. And I mean, he did do it. So they're not entirely wrong. And it's also not that far removed from the real actual, you know, well, certainly the mindset of the politician. You start winning elections and you have a staff that just say everything you do is awesome, even though it's not quite the magical approach to what I, you know, what I say goes like a CEO. uh, It's a similar sort of, uh, you know, disconnect from reality. Right. And popular things that Ramaswamy says, in addition to there cutting the federal things. government by 75 percent and uh, sucking up to Russia. Ramaswamy says he'd pardon Trump despite new charges. He also says yeah. uh, U.S. must reduce aid given to Israel. Uh, these are really popular things with the public. Mm. Now, you know, well, they're popular with Republicans. So, you know, he's saying the right things for a populist. Yeah. Uh, and so that's part of the yes. reason why on online polls he does so well. Uh, but, you know, will he do well in real life or will he just come across as being uh, a shallow, young, uh, callow, I think, is is the yeah. proper term for him, fellow? Yes. Then I need who, to ask him about uh, peas will and guacamole. not do as well in the long run. We'll see. But I don't know. I don't uh, think he's the guy that's going to be Trump. It's fun to see them do things like that and to reveal their ignorance of the way things work, which, of course, they say, well, that's because I'm an outsider. The way things work is you know, that's the problem with America. OK. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, there's one to five of these people every time. So. OK. Interesting. Yang did come to mind. <laughs> Uh, wherever he is these days. Uh, yeah, and he almost I think he flirted with party switches and didn't he start his own and maybe he's a Republican now, I don't know. So, you probably heard about the novel legal theory that the 14th yes. amendment. Yes. Oh, we forgot to get to this. Yes. Uh, well, there's, there's not much to say about it because it's is not true. happening. Uh, right. But, you know, it's kind of interesting because people jumped on it. Yeah. Uh so these two Long legal scholars ago. said, you know, uh basically uh, protection embodied in the amendments often overlooks Section 3 automatically excludes from future office and position of power and also from any equivalent office and position of power in the states and their subdivisions. Any person who's Ooh, taken an oath to support and defend the Constitution and thereafter rebels against that sacred charter, even though either through uh, overt insurrection or by giving aid or comfort to the Constitution's enemy. Right. That's what it says. It was exciting because these two were Republicans. You have to enforce it somewhere. Yes. So J. Michael Ludig and Lawrence Tribe wrote an article together, the conservative and the liberal in Atlantic Magazine. The Constitution uh-huh. prohibits Trump from ever being president. Again, the only question sure is whether American citizens today can uphold that commitment. Yeah. Uh, David Rothkoff, uh, who is a uh, foreign policy expert, says, you know, it's rare that the right thing, the best thing and the best thing for the GOP are all the same thing. <laughs> But there's two yeah, ways that could happen. That. One is Trump being disqualified for the presidency, and the second is Biden and the Democrats winning big 
ending MAGA once and for all. They wouldn't end MAGA, but what they would do is end MAGA as being a part of the GOP because the party would splinter, uh, and that would be a maybe. wonderful thing to happen. Yeah, I would take that. That's not a bad idea, um, you know. Yeah, but yes, this is this is supposedly exciting because the two people who wrote the article that have uh, ignited all this excitement are Federalist Society Republicans. And so I guess the thought was, well, even they are saying, except it's just these two so far. Right. Now, and, David French, yeah. who, again, is a never Trumper ah. from the conservative side who's being sensible these oui, days, oui. writes, appeasing Donald Trump won't work. And writes, among other things that he writes, while I believe the court should intervene, even if the hour is late, it's worth remembering it would face this decision only because of the comprehensive failure of congressional Republicans. And let me be specific. There was never any way to remove Trump from American politics through the Democratic Party alone. Ending Trump's political career required Republican cooperation. and Republicans have shirked their constitutional duties, sometimes through sheer cowardice. Yes. They've punted the responsibilities to other branches of government or simply shrunk back in fear. In hindsight, for example, Republican inaction after January 6 boggles the mind. Rather than remove Trump from American politics by convicting him in the Senate after his second impeachment, yes, Republicans sure punted the responsibility to the American legal system. Yes, they did because do that. Because of GOP cowardice, our nation is generally, genuinely facing the possibility of a president staking the oath of office while also appealing one or more substantial prison sentences. Yes. Uh, that was supposed to be their job. They did not do it. Uh, I don't know why they didn't do it. And since several of them were running for president or contemplating it, and they were all sitting as jurors in the Senate, uh, they should have absolutely taken the opportunity to uh, uh, stab Caesar in the back. He was right there. Right. I hey, was that how count, uh, commenting on the Federalists. See, because when oh, Federalists boy. do it, it's very serious people. It's cool, and you, you got to comment, comment on it. Right. Subjecting Trump to prosecution will subject the law to politics. No. You can see all of that and still support Trump's prosecutions as a calculated but necessary risk. Americans say it's a political act. It is, because taking on any candidate is a political act, out hat says. If you see things that way, good. You see clearly you're acting reasonably. My, Ross Downhout's concern, is not enough people clearly see what's risk in these kind of proceedings. That many of Trump's opponents still regard some form of legal action as a Trump card. That with the right mix of interpretation and moral righteousness, you can simply bend political reality to your will. So here's the point I, as a non-scholar, want to make. All right. Even if they're correct on some pure Empyrean level, the correctness would be unavailing in reality and the prescription as a political matter would be disastrous and toxic. Um, And that might be true. Yes, uh, mostly because there's uh, Republicans on the other side and they will say, well, it doesn't appear to be becoming toxic. We will have to make it toxic by doing this to the next Democrat, regardless of the facts. Right. Interesting. That's how it'll work. All right. Welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on... Hey, where are we? Netroots Radio. That's right. Okay, well, plenty to catch up on, as usual. Uh, Want to talk more about the crazy 14th Amendment thing? We can. There's been a number of articles. How about this article, which is an article about how this article was already written many, many years ago by Brian Boitler, because he was one of the people that wrote it. And then uh, we can... I don't know. We could probably dismiss all the rest of them except for the ones that uh, Greg mentioned because they're already mentioned and we don't, well, uh, dismissing them doesn't do us any good at this point. But uh, you already get the sense of what's going on, right? The basics of the story. If you haven't actually read these things, uh, you know, it's worth exploring so that you know in the background what's going on. It is of some interest that Federalist Society Republicans were the ones to say this and they have an enormous uh long 126 maybe page uh, uh law review article journal whatever i think it's at u pen and uh it's great it's well documented it's more you know it's the kind of thing you need to put out there on the record in order to sway people and to move courts to action as opposed to you know shorter format articles in the newspaper but anyway uh let me uh, use Brian's big tent uh, uh, newsletter to round it up. It's not entirely clear 
how he's formatted this thing in this sort of a weird way, but I'm sure it makes sense to him and to frequent readers. Uh, he writes here uh, at the end of last week, the uh, uh, he says an emergency option to disqualify Donald Trump from the presidency under the 14th Amendment may finally be ripe. He's numbering his paragraphs here for some reason. Seven years in, many analysts have grown understandably skeptical of anything that sounds even a little bit resistance-brained. And this kind of sort of does. And maybe this explains why the idea of using the 14th Amendment to disqualify Trump uh, hasn't caught on especially well because everybody's like oh yeah that's one of these you know it's like the online hashtag resistance people have come up with this weird esoteric thing that requires kind of sort of maybe if not misinterpreting then uh, more than optimistically interpreting some uh, provision of the constitution usually one that's never really been exercised before this one's gotten a little bit of a workout. Of course, it was a post-Civil War amendment, and it was used post-Civil War, and so, you know, it really did get some use at that point, but hasn't been touched for quite a while since, except uh, there were some people who said, well, why can't we do this to uh, members of Congress who engaged in some fashion in in the January 6th insurrection? Can we try to... Just, to uh, disqualify uh, murdery trader Green from the ballot in Georgia and Madison Cawthorn from the ballot in North Carolina. And they actually did try this. And uh, as expected, it would sort of depend on the judge. Uh, what are we going to make of this thing? It's not entirely clear, I guess, from the record and from its use, the 14th Amendment, whether or not this was really something that, you know, like, what's the mechanism? Who declares someone ineligible? And that was never entirely clear. And it was probably a lot clearer post Civil War when the question was, well, what do you mean who declares you? It will be this giant army that will murder you if you don't listen to them. Oh, well, that is, that is clear. But now it's not quite as clear. Anyway, they got nowhere with Murdery Trader Green because, you know, the judge was like, oh, we haven't tried this thing for a hundred and something years. I don't know. It sounds like, baloney to me. Forget it. It sounds resistance brain. So away with you. Madison Cawthorn's judge said, well, I don't know, maybe kind of, I guess this would kind of work. Certainly the thing that Madison Cawthorn is arguing, which is that uh, the amnesty extended to former Confederates also extends to me 150 years later. Uh, no, that isn't going to work. Uh, so, well, all right, I guess we're going to have to figure out how this is going to go until finally Madison Cawthorn lost his primary and the judge said, phew, I don't actually have to decide this and we were left with nothing. So anyway, as Brian says, yes, uh, it's understandable that people would be skeptical of anything that sounds even a little bit resistance brained, but many of the incentives in this case point in the right direction, including the fact that booting Trump from the ballot would help Chief Justice Roberts and other GOP-appointed justices set back the cause of expanding the Supreme Court, right? Like if they were to rule the other way for some reason, then people would be like, this is outrageous. And in a second Biden term with now nothing to lose and no ability to run for president again anyway, maybe we could finally push him into uh, the other position on expanding the Supreme Court. Well, okay, back to Brian here. Uh, political junkies spent the summer of 2024 marveling at the fact that Donald Trump's, Trump's path to the Repo Republican presidential nomination <sighs> under multiple, now four, felony indictments appeared unimpeded. But what if it's completely impeded and most American political junkies just missed it? As many of us contemplated uh, scenarios like Trump running for president while on trial, or from jail or prison, or for the express purpose of pardoning himself, two conservative legal scholars put finishing touches on a paper for the University of Pennsylvania Law Review, arguing, in effect, that Trump's candidacy is invalid and that swearing him into the presidency would violate the Constitution. Their argument rests on both a review of the evidence for Trump's role in fomenting the January 6th insurrection and a straightforward reading of the 14th Amendment, the third section of which reads, no, I will put a constitution voice, no person shall we, I don't know. Do you think maybe they have a, maybe it's an effeminate 
boy, a more feminine, let's say, voice. And a feminine has uh, got all sorts of baggage that comes with it. It's a femme presenting voice, but I don't really have a very good one. Only ones that sound like uh, fake, but they're all fake. Oh, these are all fake voices. No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress, this very serious man says to you, or elector of president, by the way, or in vice president. So those are important people, by the way, all right? Uh, this is an interesting point. No one's really discussed this as far as I have seen, but I should probably read you the, the, the part of the, the section here and then go back and comment on it. No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or under any state who, having previously taken an oath, as a member of Congress, or as an officer of the United States, or as a member of any state legislature, or as an executive or judicial officer of any state, to support the Constitution of the United States, and then, it should say, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. In other words, if you at any level, as a public official, take an oath to support the Constitution of the United States and then engage in insurrection, you will be disqualified from holding office federally or on the state level, which is pretty remarkable and broad. Because most of the other mentions of disqualification in the Constitution refer only to the federal government, office under the United States, although I suppose you could be interpreting that as uh, meaning uh, the several states as well. But anyway, uh, so here you have it. Now, the note I wanted to make here uh, is just just how important are the various offices, right? So they say you can't do this if you were a senator or a representative and you took this oath and then you violate the oath. Okay, those are important people. And they get around to saying, you know, I mean, there will be literalists who say it doesn't mention the president in there, so it's okay if it's the president. It's not illegal if the president does it. No, not really, because any office under the United States, as an officer of the United States, that would cover the presidency. Although, you know, I guess, again, and this will lead us to uh, where I was thinking originally of going with the 14th Amendment thing, uh, it was pretty clear, for instance, in the terms of the lease for the old post office pavilion that was eventually leased to Trump and converted into the Trump hotel, at least for a while, till he sold it, uh, it said quite clearly that no officer, you know, nobody uh, working for the government and no officer of the United States was eligible to hold this lease. And the GSA, for whatever reason, decided to interpret this thing as meaning, oh, yeah, but the president isn't an officer of the United States. That's not, it's just not what he is. He's just something different. He's bigger and more awesome but he's not an officer of the United States. Well, that was a ludicrous interpretation. And a sign right away, and we could have Armando on on Friday, we could talk just about emoluments. But that, well, that whole case was a, an indication right from the beginning that there was just not going to be any law as long as Trump was in office, and maybe even before he got there. It was like People were just going to get out of his way and let him do whatever the hell he wanted, and uh, no matter how ridiculous it was on its face. But what I was going to say here is, they're listing the important jobs, right? Senator, rep uh, representative, and then blah, 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 uh, officer of the United States, judges, etc. But what they include in here, it, interestingly, so listed third, no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress, or elector of president and vice president. This is the members of the electoral college. So if you were at any point thinking, yes, it was bad that they tried to fake electoral college certificates and, you know, but no, obviously it was never going to work, but it's kind of stupid. And then charging these people like these are nobodies, et cetera. And I explained very often they're, you know, they're muckety mucks in state politics. But generally speaking, they're not known nationally because it actually the Constitution forbids senators and members of Congress from being electors because they're the ones who have to, to certify the votes and everything. You don't want to have people certifying their own votes, right? So somebody else is going to have to be it. Uh, and we all think they're nobodies because we don't know anybody in the other states. But they're actually locally pretty important. But what they're saying here in the 14th Amendment is these are the people who really, truly can't be doing this stuff. Senators and representatives and then electors. And then basically you're saying that's an important, that's a pretty important thing to be listed after senator and representative. And so therefore 
Gee whiz, is it really a bad crime to fake documents and say that you're an elector for president or vice president? Well, if you look at this, they're third listed. Like the third most important group of of federal officials there are, are the electors for president and vice president. And you just faked up documents that said you were one? That's nuts. You should be going to jail. Now let's get on to the rest of the 14th Amendment things. Uh, but anyway, as it turns out, um, it is it is pretty straightforward. But, you know, so what? As I was saying, uh, well, maybe I'll read the rest of the article. But the hint here is think the think about the way Armando and I used to talk about the emoluments problem. Skipping over all of this, in case you haven't read this one or in case you have read the ones from The Atlantic or you read a little other reports about what the conservative Republican Federalist Society people were saying, yes, 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 it's all very straightforward and says that this can be done. Now, who's going to do something about it? This is, you know, it. Trump is barred from office the way he was barred from accepting emoluments. There's two clauses in the Constitution that says the president is barred from taking emoluments unless there's spe- you know, specific action from the Congress, which is the same, a similar structure to what's in the 14th Amendment, by the way. And they totally ignored it and just said, Meh. well, I mean, it says this, but who are we to say that it says this? Doesn't somebody have to do what uh, the courts should do something? Courts, what the hell with that? You, you, it's a political problem. The, the legislature should do something. <laughs> just don't look at us. The people should do something. Someone can sue. Right? You know, Nobody's willing to do anything. Uh, and that's where you are with the 14th Amendment. Well, we're, de- we're sure it definitely says this, and it's so clear. All we have to do is just act and find the political will. Who? Well, all of us acting in concert. Sure, at the most divided point in the country. Why don't we all just act in concert, and then we'll get it all done, right? So essentially, the law says this, and we all look at each other and say, it's, it's right there. It's right there. And Trump is like, well, I, my swearing in is scheduled. Are you going to do something or are you not? Uh, um, and then Ross Dathout writes, well, yeah, you could do it. It's true, but it'll be terrible for the country. I shudder to think what the payback is going to be like. And then everybody will elect not to do it. And uh, we're going to have the same problem here. But all right, back to Brian Boitler here, because part of his point is, I know, we already said this. The professors who wrote this thing, William Baud of, uh, I guess, uh, Baud. Yeah, I guess so. Bode? Maybe Bode, because he drops a hint in one of his section subtitles. William Bode, B-A-U-D-E, of the University of Chicago, and Michael Stokes Paulson of the University of St. Thomas. Well, you know, they were not the first to notice this long-ignored Reconstruction-era injunction and to apply it to Trump's conduct in 20 and 2020 and 21, it occurred to at least a few of us as the Capitol was under siege and percolated for a brief heady period until Republicans once again closed ranks behind Mr. Trump and put the idea of swift accountability to an end. Right. As the insurrection was going on, people were saying this is an insurrection and the 14th Amendment mentions that and he should be ineligible for office and yada, 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 et cetera, et cetera. But then the very next thing that happened, major thing that happened politically was they said, well, uh, I'll tell you what, we're going to present you a different path and one that is not in dispute to disqualification of Trump from federal office, at the very least impeachment. And we've already impeached plenty of presidents now. And in fact, you've already impeached this one once already. And there is no dispute that if convicted, one of the penalties is that you can bar them from office. And we know exactly who would impose that. It's you. This decision is going to be put to you in a matter of days. What are you going to do? And they said, we're actually going to actively work to prevent this from happening. So it seems a bit of a pipe dream to say, well, you know, there's the 14th Amendment route, even though it's not entirely clear who handles that one. When it was entirely clear who handled it, they still wouldn't do it. So, back to Brian again. But even when the idea was most fresh, the difficulty with it lay in the fact that the Constitution is just words on paper. Its diktats may be the law of the land in theory, 
but to practically prohibit Trump from seeking office again would require devising an enforcement mechanism so that clerks across the country would refrain from placing his name on a ballot, just as they'd stand in the way of a non-citizen or a 30-year-old attempting to enter a candidacy. Can you imagine that? It's that much easier for them to say, well, on account of the fact that you're 30 Three, or I don't know if they would do it to a 34-year-old. He might be 35 by Inauguration Day. But, but by virtue of the fact that you're 30, that's it. Nope, you cannot be on the ballot. I mean, why not? What if a clerk says, sure you can. What if 50 clerks say, yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, that can happen here too, right? He's barred from office. And a Republican clerk could say, no, he's not. I'm putting him on the ballot here. Sue me. See if you can stop me before Election Day. But I will point out, by the same token, by the way, even if nobody makes any decisions anywhere, no adjudications of any kind to point to that say the words insurrection, there are clerks. What if a what if a Democratic leading clerk in a big ass state says, I'm not I'm not putting them on there. I'm not. And sue me if you think you can get them on there. It'd be the right thing to do to sue and settle it, I think to find out in court rather than leaving it up to one clerk unilaterally. But you can be sure that some clerk somewhere will act unilaterally on behalf of Trump. Go ahead, act unilaterally against Trump. You have my permission. Go for it. Anyway, yes. So, right. Uh, and interestingly, like no one would stop uh, a clerk from saying, I'm acting unilaterally if a non-citizen, yikes, or a 30-year-old attempted to run for president. Less than a week after the insurrection, the appellate advocate Deepak Gupta and I, Brian Boydler himself, published an early article in the New York Times on the promise of the 14th Amendment option and suggested a few remedies, like, for instance, an act of Congress or clever litigation or a combination of the two. In January of 2021, before Trump had faced his second impeachment, those options weren't yet ripe. Two and a half years later, Trump is the runaway favorite to win the GOP presidential nomination for the third time. One of his best polling challengers, former Governor Chris Christie of New Jersey, has demonstrated a rare willingness among Republicans to confront Trump over his corruption and lawlessness. He and many other leading Republicans have publicly committed themselves to the view that Trump is uniquely positioned among candidates to lose the 2024 election. Secretaries of State will soon have to make determinations regarding who is eligible to run for president and who is not. The issue is suddenly very ripe, and plucking it sooner rather than later would serve the interests of all Americans, including the former president, whose very freedom may be at stake. Is this more about this, or is this... Uh, I can't... I, yeah, I think this is... Uh, well, maybe this is, I, I can't tell because of the way he numbers things here and separates them into sections. Is he just, is this a newsletter about a number of political items or is this continuation of the discussion of this one? Well, we'll read on and find out, I guess. Uh, for seven years now, Trump's most distressed critics have fantasized about Trump doing himself in to an at times unhealthy extent. They've grabbed hold of controversies or evidence and reimagined them as stakes through the heart. Republican voters will turn on him for saying this. He'll surely be impeached or prosecuted for doing that. They've persisted in this thinking, even as few occurrences ever set in motion a cascade of events that alter the course of history. They want God from the machine, but keep getting Robert Mueller shuffling out from behind the curtain. Because of this mismatch... The notion that Trump might be ejected from public life, or at least political life, by anything other than sickness or death, or death, right, sickness or death, has become a laugh line among jaded liberals. When the uh, Bode Paulson paper landed, Matthew Iglesias spoke for all those liberals with this arch comment, it's over for Trump. Haha, <laughs> wink, wink, snake bit as we all are, though, it actually might be. Brian, very optimistic about this one. Given all the history, we should obviously not assign high odds to any potential coup de grace. The, since the, oh, and since the odds are low, many commentators will scoff at the mere possibility. Nothing embarrasses public intellectuals more than putting stock in unlikely outcomes that don't come to pass. But that is the source of huge blind spots. 
Just as Trump's victories in 2016 and his insurrection in 2020 took the punditocracy by surprise, so might the means of his downfall. All right, the logic is there. Difficult as it is to set a watershed moment in motion or identify one before it's happened, we shouldn't stop puzzling out how individuals with power could act to protect the country or make things better. I mean, I guess from that perspective, I would say uh, certainly the same could have been said of the exercise of the nuclear option to reform or eliminate the filibuster. And we just said, well, to hell with that. Let's try anyway. And in part, it worked. And in part, it did not. But okay. Uh, It isn't hard to imagine a handful of actors with a mix of pure and cynical motivations aligning to give teeth to the Constitution in this instance. Liberals view Trump as a menace to the constitutional order and want him banished. Republican leaders want their Trump problem taken care of so they can win more elections, but they also want someone else to get to rid them of him. And crucially, the Supreme Court's six Republican appointed justices want to rule the country without ever whipping up so much scorn that Congress eventually strips them of power. They are the ones who would ultimately have to decide whether the Constitution applies to Trump or not, and we shouldn't reduce the analysis they'd run to the most simplistic one available. Hmm, We shouldn't reduce the analysis, yeah, okay. Uh, Quite apart from whether they can be convinced, as Bode and Paulson conclude, that the case is not even close, that's their words for it, their extra-legal considerations would include questions like, Will ending Mr. Trump's political career be good or bad for the Republican Party, the conservative movement? Will involving the court in presidential politics again harm or bolster its standing with the public? Here's the juncture where conservatives might finally come to appreciate how blessed they are to have a strategically subtle operator like Chief Justice John Roberts at the helm of the court. It's also where liberals should be careful what they wish for. Oh boy, here we come again. Roberts, who once employed uh, Bode as a clerk, much uh, would be much more apt than a hostile partisan warrior like Sam Alito, let's say, to see a huge upside for the court in bringing the Trump era to an abrupt end, particularly if he could persuade one or two or even all three Trump-appointed justices to join him. The dividend would be in reestablishing the court's perceived independence and thus making it more difficult for proponents of court reform like me, Brian Boitler, to build a public case for bringing the John Roberts era to an end. Court reform will not happen unless public opinion renders the status quo intolerable. And the most intolerable feature of the status quo is the reality that the Roberts court is a handmaid for right wing interests. What simpler and more powerful tool would allow Roberts to sever perception from reality, to persuade the public that the court isn't hopelessly corrupted by the party that stole it, than for Trump to be rendered ineligible for the presidency by some of the very justices appointed to life tenure? This is, uh, I guess, the, the, the judicial version of Nixon to China sort of thing. Only they could pull this off. The 14th Amendment option thus forces liberals to choose between competing priorities, advancing the long-term goal of remedying right-wing capture of the Supreme Court on the one hand, locking in the urgent imperative of protecting U.S. democracy from Trump on the other. Reasonable minds will differ, but I'd argue an incremental setback in the fight against the out-of-control court would be worth the salutary or yeah, salutary effect of expelling Trump from politics and through the very institutions he's tried so hard to control or degrade. There cannot be a free and fair election with Trump on the ballot, and so we should place an extraordinarily high priority on keeping him off. This is an urgent question, and tipping the balance in favor of banishing Trump will thus require people to act urgently. So, The Roberts Court will grow less inclined to upend the election the closer we get to primary contests and to say nothing of next year's fall campaign. Tossing Trump when Republicans have time to regroup is a much easier sell than tossing him after he's already the nominee. But the question won't go away until either Trump loses or the court renders its judgment, as it will be uh, as it will likely be compelled to at some point. The worst possible outcome for the country and for the court would be for someone to raise the question only after Trump has won 
After he begins to wield the very power that the Constitution holds, he must never be allowed to regain. That is a good uh, summary of events, I think, at this point. And, uh, yeah, well, that's the end of it, too, is it? We've actually got to the end of it. Finally, I can tell by the way he formats his newsletter exactly where we are and all that. All right, so all true, all good points, and uh, better, really, than spending time on analyzing the 14th Amendment argument, per se. But, yes, uh, true, it's still hanging out there that this is something that requires some action. There's a lot of insistence that it's automatic somehow, but I think we've all learned that there's nothing automatic about anything, and sometimes it falls to, or some, you know, sometimes you wouldn't have guessed that it would fall to such an official. Nobody would have thought that the GSA would be the final determinant of whether or not there was an emoluments violation or whether it mattered at all. But again, it was pretty clear that, I mean, it's, it's not a presidential disqualification clause, the emoluments. It's just, uh, you know, it's just a prohibition on accepting the emoluments, but leaves it up to Congress to decide whether or not there's been a violation or whether they can waive the violation. Uh, but it doesn't kick him immediately out of office. But it's as clear as day that the president is not permitted to do this thing and everybody just let him do this thing. And then when he, even people tried to bring him to court over it, the courts basically threw a lot of that stuff out. Yeah, I don't know. Nobody else has said anything so far, so why should we? Look. Sup fam, it's your boy Darwin, aka Darwin underscore Darko, aka the most reasonable man in America, aka KITM's senior black correspondent. You might remember me from such recordings as Spacemen vs. Space Cadets and You Need to Talk About Joe Biden. Today, I want to bring you good news about that thing you've been struggling with. Do you suffer from giving too much of a damn? Do you turn on the series of tubes and find yourself outraged at the particular way some news organization strung some sentences together only to realize, nope, this is not some fictional hellscape? Well, guess what? You no longer have to accept a life of giving too much of a damn. You can do something about it because even you, yes you, can be a show contributor. Now I know what you're thinking. Hey, Mr. Most Reasonable Man in America, I'm not some professional podcast talking guy. Don't worry about it. Do you have a smartphone or some other electronic recording device? Well, that's all you need. You too can have a segment where you can read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Fair warning though, side effects may include general punditry, having opinions and hot takes, getting stuff off your chest, and hearing your own voice. If your recording lasts longer than five to seven minutes, please consult kagorx at gmail.com. That's K-A-G-R-O-X at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the Kegor in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. So much to catch up on, including some uh, listener comments. Uh, for instance, Mighty OCD, who reminds us uh, when we're looking forward to the Trump surrender and booking uh though we might in fact get an answer about his height if they make him take his shoes off uh for the uh measurement and the the photo and i don't even know if they still do the photos against those backgrounds that indicate the height uh but i uh, i they don't give out your weight and that's not something i as i've ever seen uh although maybe on a like on a wanted poster they might do something like that just, just as part of the the general description when they're giving people the the warning to be on the lookout for somebody. Uh, It makes a difference, you know, uh, in bringing in the suspects. Not the police care. They'll bring in whoever they feel like. Anyway, uh, yeah, they're not likely to tell us what he weighed, but uh, they can at least tell us his height, and that should be fun and interesting all by itself. Uh, Let's see, other things that, uh, let's see, caught Ricky's ear. Uh, Let's see, so are evangelicals saying that Trump is bigger than Jesus? Yes, that occurred to me. As a possibility, he's wrapping himself up in the uh, John Lennon thing there. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's what they're saying, I guess. Or at least some of them are. And some of them will be mad about that somehow. But maybe not, because people are weird. All right, let's see. What else was her comment here? Speaking of Nikki Haley, where are we? I know she got mentioned. I didn't really want to speak of Nikki Haley. But have you all seen her campaign ad where they had to fake a rally for her in the ad. It's obvious, so obviously fake that it's sad. No, I haven't seen that one. And of course, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think Nikki Haley has ever had a big, large-scale attended rally. 
I mean, I'm sure she's had a rally, but it's, you know, in, in a local park or something because she's, she's campaigning. But no, I haven't seen that one, but that should be funny. Maybe we'll be on the lookout for that one. And Brian Monroe points us to uh, a, a Mastodon toot from who? Alicorn Schuyler, who says that uh, in many, with lots of hashtags here, hashtag Donald, hashtag Trump, legal defense fund, hashtag website, got hashtag hacked. A laughing emoji uh, pointing to the PatriotLegalDefenseFund.com, which I guess was his site. And uh, somebody has hacked it and uh, put up some, I guess, supposedly humorous uh, material in its place. And I don't know, is it worth uh, reading? But they took the uh, Trump site and uh, and messed around with it. And some people are enjoying it. I can't read what is actually happening here, but it's certainly much better material than was actually once there. So, okay, noting for the record that this is happening. Okay. Uh, now, other articles that I wanted to share with you, there are many, lots of different directions, lots of other things that happened over the weekend that we haven't uh, mentioned yet, including uh, just before the weekend, I had uh, parked a story that I thought, oh, well, this is getting very serious out there. Everybody knows that uh, the the uh, Republican anti-LGBTQ campaigning is creating enormous problems and dangers for uh, the community and for everybody. In general, and the Chicago Tribune had a story which is now blocked by their paywall uh, that I thought I should share with you. Man pleads guilty to hate crime for pre-drag show vandalism at Lake in the Hills Bakery. Um, this, of course, a, uh, a case coming to an end. The man accused of vandalizing a bakery in Lake in the, Hill, Lake in the Hills ahead of a planned family-friendly drag show pleaded guilty to a felony hate crime charge in McHenry County Court on Wednesday of last week. Prosecutors had charged Joseph Collins, 25, with a hate crime and criminal property damage and defacement after the July 2022 attack at Uprising Bakery and Cafe. The Allsip residents spray-painted anti-LGBTQ plus epithets on the business and smashed three windows and a glass door with a bat, prosecutors said. But of course, anyway... The stakes were raised on that immeasurably, as I'm sure you're now aware, over the weekend in Cedar Glen, California, where, uh, well, there's two angles to give here. One, the report, as it is reported straightforward, and then the critique on the report. Uh, I'll give you the headline. You know the story I'm talking about by now, I'm sure. A store owner shot to death right in front of her shop after dispute over LGBTQ plus pride flag, authorities say, and the critics immediately saying in response to that, no, there wasn't a dispute over the LGBTQ plus pride flag. Like, you should have that, you should not have that. That's not a dispute. It is somebody expressing their free speech rights and somebody else who no doubt is screaming about being a free speech absolutist on Twitter, shooting them to death over it. That's not a dispute over the flag. That's just a murder that happened because of the flag. But at the heart of the story, and more aligned with a discussion of the facts, yes, uh, a uh, uh, the the 66-year-old owner of a California clothing store shot to death because the guy who had the gun with him, coincidentally, for no particularly good reason, uh, just as angry that there should even be such a flag and whoever owns them should be murdered, apparently. The man ran away from the store after the shooting on Friday night, but was later found and killed in a confrontation with officers from the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department. The agency said Laura Ann Carlton was pronounced dead at Magpie, M-A-G-P-I, Magpie, I guess. The store she owned and operated in Cedar Glen, a small community in the San Bernardino Mountains, was roughly 60 miles east of downtown Los Angeles. And then they got a hurricane and an earthquake on top of it all. 
<sighs> so there you go. Before the shooting, the man made several disparaging remarks about a rainbow flag that stood outside the store. Sheriff's officials said it wasn't immediately clear what happened when officers confronted the man whose identity had been hadn't been released as of Sunday. Carlton, who preferred to be called Lori, L-A-U-R-I, is survived by her husband and nine children in a blended family. An LGBTQ group in nearby Lake Arrowhead said Carlton didn't identify as a member of the LGBTQ plus community, but she spent time helping and advocating for everyone and was defending her pride flags placed in front of her shop on the night of the shooting, the group said. So we have that happening. I just want to acknowledge that that story is out there on top of all the other tragedies befalling California and Note for the record that, yeah, you know, as many others have before me and will continue to do and, and will unfortunately be given more opportunities to do so, uh, point out that things have grown well beyond control here and that there are very definitely people driving this and we know who they are and they are to blame and they should be held to account. But we don't know how to hold anybody to account, even when they facially violate the Constitution. So that's a little unfortunate. Okay, other items for discussion Uh, I'll just throw this one in sort of at random. HuffPost has got this one, and you'll all be happy to uh, hear about it. Something crazy going on in right-wing world. The fired founder of Project Veritas, you know who that is, James O'Keefe. Did you remember that he got fired? From, you know, by the board of, of Project Veritas. Not everybody remembers that one. And I, ha- I have that inkling, but I don't remember the circumstances. Well, anyway, the fired founder of Project Veritas is under investigation in New York. Isn't that exciting? And where better to be under investigation? I also saw something over the weekend about um, internal strife and arguments at Project Veritas. And I don't know whether I put them aside, but apparently the people... Whom, uh, with whom uh, O'Keefe was replaced, have since uh, made many, many enemies among the remainder of those working for Project Veritas, and then uh, had some mass layoffs there as well. And so, uh, good, it's collapsing under its own weight, and you know that's always kind of good news. But anyway, let's read about what's going on with James O'Keefe. Uh, fired from the right-wing operation for spending an excessive amount of donor funds on personal luxuries, wink, wink, the company's board uh, eventually rid themselves of him, and now uh, he's under investigation. Who's reporting this? AP story, actually, but it is running in HuffPost. That's where I picked it up. Michael R. Sisak reporting for the AP, saying that the founder of Project Veritas, you know who he is and what they do, is under investigation by a suburban New York prosecutor's office in the latest fallout after his ouster from the group over allegations that he mistreated workers and misspent organization funds. The Westchester County District Attorney's Office confirmed Friday it is, quote, looking into matters concerning James O'Keefe, who was suspended in February and later fired as chairman and CEO. The Project Veritas board said he spent an excessive amount of donor funds on personal luxuries. Jim, uh, Jin, not Jim, but J-I-N. That's what it says. Jin Huang, Wang, W-H-A-N-G. A spokesperson for the district attorney, Mimi Roca, declined to discuss the subject or details of the investigation or what potential charges, if any, O'Keefe could face. Oh, Huang cautioned that investigations can have a variety of outcomes, not necessarily resulting in criminal charges. So we're not there yet. News of the probe was first reported by The Nation. O'Keefe's lawyer, Jeffrey Lichtman, blamed the investigation on, quote, disgruntled former employees of Project Veritas who had a problem with their CEO using too many car services to pay for fundraising efforts which paid their salaries. We were told by the new Project Veritas CEO that the investigation had ended, Lichtman said. If it's not, we will crush it in court. In a statement, CEO Hannah Giles, is it Giles or Giles? I don't know. But uh, she, I think, infamously was involved in, she was the, the person involved in the first breakout viral video that Project Veritas ever put out, even before they were Project Veritas, I think. But O'Keefe, you know, the infamous one where he, uh, what, goes uh, dressed as a, 
or uh, claims to have entered dressed as a pimp and bringing girls in there to see if he could, what was it? I don't remember, seek benefits of some sort from them from a government program or was it uh, a, a non-profit organization that, that spent grant funds? Anyway, I can't even remember the original story, but uh, there we are. That's uh, But that was she was the girl in the video. Now she's the CEO of Project Veritas. And it's interesting that their fates weren't tied together. They must have grown apart at some point. Anyway, in a statement, CEO Hannah Giles said, the Project Veritas did not initiate any potential investigation the Westchester DA's office may be conducting with respect to James O'Keefe. However, PV cooperates with the authorities as required by law, which is a new thing for them because they used to get arrested all the time. In 2010, O'Keefe founded Project Veritas, which identifies itself as a news organization. Sure, why not? Its most recent IRS filings show it brought in more than $20 million in revenue in 2021. Over the years, its hidden cameras have embarrassed news outlets, labor organizations, and Democratic politicians, sort of. The organization sued O'Keefe in May, accusing him of breaching his contract with incredibly troubling workplace and financial misconduct, including screaming at colleagues. He's never worked anywhere. He doesn't know how to conduct himself. Exposing employees to obscene messages and having staffers run errands for him, such as picking up laundry and cleaning his boat. Among O'Keefe's lavish spending, the organization alleges, were $10,000 for a helicopter flight from New York to Maine, more than $150,000 on private car services over an 18-month span, and expensive stays in luxury hotel suites, while other employees were forced to stay in budget accommodations. Hmm. According to the lawsuit, Project Veritas's board had intended to reinstate O'Keefe from his suspension with appropriate safeguards, but ultimately terminated his employment in May after he claimed in media interviews that the organization had fired him to appease a pharmaceutical company over its reporting on COVID-19. Last year, two Florida residents pleaded guilty to selling a diary and other items from President Joe Biden's daughter to Project Veritas for $40,000, As part of its investigation, the FBI searched the group's Mamaroneck, New York offices and the homes of some employees in 2021. Neither Project Veritas nor any staffers has been charged with the crime. The group has said its activities were protected by the First Amendment. So we'll see whether they violated any uh, uh, statutes and are in fact under investigation for crime and the First Amendment is of no avail to them or what happens. But that's the latest on Project Veritas, and it's exciting. Then, of course, uh, there was more about the infighting somewhere. But I wonder if I can uh, find out about that, because it would make a nice segue. But I didn't think it was – there just wasn't, I I thought, enough, quite enough to the story to justify parking it at first. But then – that was, later I saw that he was under investigation, and I thought, oh, okay, well, my, that might have made a nice follow-up to this. But, yeah, I don't see anything uh, that uh, is going to help us figure out what's going on internally at this point. Uh, if I stumble upon it later on in the week, I can uh, bring it back and uh, resurrect it as a topic. Okay, let's see. Now back to... What's in pocket, and uh, we'll see what other stories I meant to uh, pass your way. There were a couple of them that I threw out to you at the end of last week for weekend reading, and eh, in all likelihood, you, like me, uh, didn't spend your weekend catching up on all of that, but uh, maybe we can uh, round some of that stuff up tomorrow as well. Let me throw this one in. This was, I thought, an interesting premise and something to think about. Hmm, Well, let's see. Well, let's read it because I've already introduced it here. But uh, Dr. H over at Daily Coast threw out a diary on Thursday that I thought was an interesting premise. And I'm not sure how much substance there is to it, but our Canadian listeners might be particularly interested. Uh, The headline of the piece here, Meanwhile... Canada is making plans in case the USA becomes, quote, authoritarian. I thought this was an interesting 
premise for an article like, yeah, you know, that's actually something maybe you need to watch out for. Clearly, we're all worried about that. How would the Canadians react to that? I mean, a hundred percent of the American, you know, American because they're Americans too, North American, the, the U.S. Canadian relationship is premised on our not being an authoritarian dictatorship. And we have this enormous, more or less porous border with them, uh, all because, you know, we were able to count in both directions. Both countries were able to count on the continuing commitment to democracy, the rule of law, basically being on the same page of most things, if not everything, uh, such that uh, these this relationship can continue with a number of assumptions that could be easily turned on their head and would uh, require enormous changes in the way we treat one another and enormous expense as well, I would think. It's just uh, it's a damn good question to have to contemplate and a smart government like, you know, maybe Canada at this point would be able to look ahead and say, well, what kind of planning should we be doing just in case? Are there any ways that we can prepare if we ever have to flip the switch on this situation? Uh, now, it begins here by saying uh, from Canada's, quoting from Canada's CBC News, Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie, is it J-O-L-Y, Jolie? I don't know, says Canada has been considering a, quote, game plan for how it would respond if the United States takes a far-right authoritarian shift after next year's presidential election. I should probably open the, the CBC report on it, but let's see how Dr. H summarizes things. Hmm, he says, why might Canada have some cause for concern if its neighbor to the south were to turn authoritarian, if not outright fascist? Let us count the ways. And, uh, well, let's continue on. Uh, by the way, I said he, I'm not really sure, but the, uh, the uh, avatar image that Dr. H here has chosen presents as male. It's not a photo of him. It's a pen and ink rendering of a, of what appears to be a male face, however. So we'll go with that as a hint. And if we're misgendering, I apologize. Uh, we'll see if anybody can tell us whether that's the case. Anyway, uh, so why might they have to be preparing for this? Uh, section one here in Dr. H's presentation of it. Payback for offenses real or imagined. Jolie drew an analogy to her government's experience working with the administration of former U.S. President Donald Trump. It's a good analogy if you're worried about his second administration which sought to limit long-established trade in crucial sectors. Trump is again running for the Republican nomination in next November's election and has promised, quote, actually used the words, retribution against his opponents and civil servants, but also probably Canadians. The standard GOP approach to government has next to nothing to do with public service, says Dr. H. Rather, the GOP sees government as having two basic functions, one, help your buddies, and two, make life hell for your enemies. Since Canada didn't kiss the defendant's hindquarters, and since Canada and uh, Canada was and is an economic competitor with the USA, one can expect that Canada might not be seen exactly as a friend and may actually be deemed deserving of revenge. Canadians are still upset about the so-called Freedom Convoy, which was loudly supported by the U.S. authoritarians. One of the organizers in Canada is expected to go to trial later this year. Canada is also looking closely at the situation to prevent something like this from ever happening again. So Canada and authoritarians might not exactly be buddies, and that will mean that the authoritarians will, in all likelihood, behave like giant pricks toward Canada, considering the composition of the GOP mouthpieces, the lengths to which they will go to become giant pricks may be, shall we say, extreme. Would military threats and saber rattling be possible? Trade wars? Border closings? The irrationality and pettiness of the GOP has so far shown no bounds. Section 2 here, hundreds of thousands of political refugees. What about that? Canada is expressly considering the prospect of political refugees, but no one is talking publicly about how many people that would be. In other words, people are finally saying, I give up, I'm leaving the United States, I can't take it or can't live here. 
under a Trump administration. If authoritarians slash fascists seize power in the USA, they will make life hell for their enemies, and there are hundreds of thousands of U.S. citizens who are their enemies. A great many may genuinely be in fear for their lives, and with good reason. Moving to Mexico will be out of the question for most people, of course. Why? I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> language barrier. Uh, Mexico saying, to hell with that, we're not letting you in here. You would never let any of us in there. I don't know. Uh, or what? But, well, certainly for many people, they would prefer the English-speaking uh, Canada. I can assume that's probably the case, too. Number three, loss of defense and intelligence sharing and scientific cooperation. Canada and the USA have had a good past relationship with international ventures in matters of defense and in matters of peace. This may change. The CBC story quotes an expert on national security from the University of Ottawa who wonders what might happen to national security if an increasingly authoritarian U.S. is increasingly unilateral and dismissive of traditional alliances like NATO or arrangements like NORAD. Military defense, including missile defense, is a major concern. So is international intelligence. Canada and the USA have historically cooperated in a number of scientific en endeavors. The nations assist one another in some aspects of regulation and sharing of services, not to mention that the USA and Canada have a number of cross-border sports rivalries. All of these may be adversely affected. Next section, redrawing borders and new alliances. The CB story, CBC story does not say so, but it would not be beyond the realm of possibility to suggest that national borders may actually change. Some U.S. states, such as those in the Northeast and far Northwest, may deem that establishing an authoritarian slash fascist government would be tantamount to abrogation of the U.S. Constitution and may actually petition to join the nation of Canada. Hmm. Canada might consider this as a viable option, especially if the number of political refugees could otherwise become overwhelming. The CBC story does not say that there are in uh, are other nations that are concerned about rising authoritarianism. Oh, does say it does say this. Oh, I thought it doesn't. Uh, misread it here. So there are other nations concerned about rising authoritarianism. You would think there would be, although no one is talking about it too loudly and it's not discussed in those terms. As Canada's relationship with the USA devolves, Canada may strengthen its relationship with Europe. May we not live, he says, in interesting times. So that's a pretty good summary, I think. And we got probably further through it than I would have gotten uh, parsing through the CBC reporting. Not that it's particularly dense or obscure or anything, but uh, it's always good to have the perspective of a fellow Daily Coast reader in interpreting all of this. So what do you think, Canadians? Is that a possibility? Probably. Uh, so uh, you'd, be, you'd be wise to do, uh, do what you can to prepare for it. And uh, it's amazing, the irony of it all, that uh, we would end up uh, political refugees uh, running to the north and having the border closed in our faces wouldn't be entirely uh, unwarranted. But OK, let's see other stories. What might we be able to fit in uh, uh, prior to the close of today's show in about two minutes? And gosh, I don't know if there's anything short that we haven't already uh, shoehorned into other uh, shows. But yeah, nothing short, nothing I think we can... Oh, maybe this one. Just uh, an Amanda Marcotte piece, which you can never really squeeze in in a few minutes, but just bring up the story just so it's on the record here. Uh, it was new last week. It's no longer the newest, but it says here, newest anti-woke tantrum. I guess... Uh, Another uh, outraged group of parents somewhere who are insisting on something awful is happening, like litter boxes, but aren't really happening. But OK, here's what's going on. Here's the newest tantrum they're into. Right wingers don't think kids of different races can be friends. I hadn't seen this one, but this apparently arising out of a bizarre racist outburst at a Texas school board, of course, isn't an isolated event. It's part of a national pattern, Amanda argues. We'll see what we can shoehorn in here. Considering how rapidly the right's war on woke is expanding, it was perhaps inevitable 
Self-identified mama bears on a Texas school board are angry that a classroom had a poster showing people of different races holding hands. Oh my God, I can't believe it. That's outrageous. Last week, the school board in Conroe, Texas, C-O-N-R-O-E, a small city north of Houston, turned the right-wing mania for censorship into a dark parody of itself. At issue, a poster that seemed to imply that interracial friendship is possible. Outrageous. According to ABC 13 Eyewitness News in Houston, things started when school trustee Melissa Dungan, Dungan, D-U-N-G-A-N, declared that she had spoken to parents who were upset about, quote, displays of personal ideologies in classrooms. Ooh, look out for those. When pressed for an example, according to the news report, Dungan referred to a first-grade student whose parent claimed that they were so upset by a poster showing hands of people of different races that they transferred classrooms. I would just say there's mental illness going on here and deal with it that way. I wish I was shocked, Dungan said of the poster. I am aware these trends have been happening for many years. Very sad. Uh, there's more to the story, of course, and you should take a look into it and see how widespread uh, Amanda thinks the phenomenon is. But we won't have much time to do that. I'll just throw this out there. One more paragraph, perhaps. Uh, some other members of the school board did, in fact, argue that there was nothing objectionable about such a poster. But Dungan was backed up by another trustee, Misty Odenweller, who insisted that the depiction of uh, race mixing was in some way a violation of the law. These two women are part of Mama Bears Rising, a secretive far-right group fueling the book-banning mania in Conroe and the surrounding area. At least 59 books have been banned due to their efforts. When another trustee asked Dungan if she personally objected to an illustration of cross-racial friendship, she demurred, simply declaring that she was just trying to avoid, quote, situations like that. Situations like what exactly? She didn't say. Dungan's behavior is a perfect illustration of the anti-woke tap dance. The person alleging nefarious wokeness never admits to their own bigotry, instead pretending that they're reacting to woke people who are pushing an agenda, in this case through innocuous poster art. Of course, the entire premise of the argument is rooted in bigotry, as this example shows, and it presumes that the feelings of real or imagined bigots who might take umbrage at such an image are of paramount importance, and everyone else's freedoms must be curtailed to appease them. You have been That's the story all the time, isn't it? In the morning. With David Waldman. Time now, though, for you to listen to Justice Putnam and the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, What's on Tap? Trump commands a strong lead over DeSantis despite his 91 felony indictments. And a well-known and beloved fashion designer, as we heard earlier, shot dead in front of our small clothing store near Lake Arrowhead. More about that from a different angle with Justice next.